Thank you. Now you can hear me. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, hello and welcome. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, space, final frontier. I even got me a communicator here for this uh, talk. And uh, even though I'm not a real Trekkie, but I'm, I've always been a science fiction fan, and I find there is uh, quite some parallels and also parallels in the problems that we are facing with open source and with IT in general. So. Some of you know me already, I like to do crazy things, and I'm a journalist. I was a team lead documentation at SUSE, and I'm doing a lot of funny things with my own company as consultant and in internet politics, and the last years have been very worksome with digital sovereignty and sustainability, and this is also where this is talk is heading, kind of. I was, as you can see with the pictures, I also like photographs, I'm not that Nazis, but I was kissed by a llama, I met some aliens, and. I like exclamation points, and uh, the last picture was taken yesterday. I found uh, a nice spoon uh, here in Croatia, which I will bring home. Um, the talk today, is, this is sort of like the agenda that I prepared for you, the, the six or seven main tasks. Um, when I say JFK moment, many, uh, many, th many people think of the assassination, but that's not what I mean. I mean uh, the, the speech of JFK, that's John F. Kennedy that started the space race, kind of, or that was in the middle of the space race. Then I'm going to talk about IT and the implications and the similar situations, then how we can catch up and why these are tasks for generations, and about learnings from projects that we had. And that it's, for, for some of you and many also outside in the internet, maybe it's the same surprising uh, effect that it was for me, that the core things that we have to address are not really technical. They are more on other layers, and I will get to that. And the, I will end with a call to action that is, tell them. So, let's run. I'm, I'm known to be a fast speaker, and I know that the, I'm, I'm known to put a lot of information in, in short talks. So. I hope that we can have a Q&A afterwards also. Okay, the situation. In the 60s, the USA was lagging behind technology-wise, behind the communist states in the early 60s. I think, um, like, yeah, pretty much like Europe is lagging behind today when it comes to IT technology. And, uh, but Europe was also behind in, later in, in, in commercial airplanes, for example, or generally in the space game until there was an Airbus, Boeing, NASA, ESA, ESA stuff coming up, and Europe caught up. And Europe is way ahead in some parts in, in terms of civil rights, GDPR, and, but where we are really lagging behind the US is in IT. We're all using software from the big five, from the, the big American corporations. And uh, my topic of this talk is how can we catch up? Because, and I, I found this, this thing that actually the US were behind in uh, the space race then, and then there was this John F. K. speech and uh, John F. Kennedy speech, and they kind of overtook the Russians in the 60s. And how is, how is that possible? And I think my co the core of my talk will be that we actually need such a moment in Europe to catch up and potentially also overtake um, the leaders in, the, in this IT game or in this IT world that we have right now. There is also scientific background to it. Um, well, in German, I like the German term Sputnik shock better because it's more uh, an immediate thing that happened, whereas the Sputnik crisis is the English word is more like a long-term thing, but the shock is really what happened. So the many Americans, and there's lots of, you can read a lot about it, how shocked people were when they heard the beeping sounds from Sputnik over their heads, and they found out that the Russians were now actually uh, faster and more in space and, and uh, further ahead technology-wise than the Americans were. And it's, um, it's a long story that goes into innovation theory and how innovation spreads and that it takes, usually takes 30 years or one generation for innovation to spread. But um, all of that seems to be, I haven't read the book, I just learned about the fact that there is a book about this. This is pretty new and recently published in the last month from Mariana Mazzucato. And she's, she's actually said the same. So I'm sorry, I did not know the book exists, but we obviously had the same ideas. So 
there is uh, probably also some uh, scientific background to, hold, to this thing. The, 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 gen the, the concept is that we need a moonshot moment, an address, like John F. Kennedy did in the early 60s. And he got the mod, he got a, it was more, was it like a motivational speech? And he got the whole country, the big USA, kind of streamlined into a commitment okay, we will do this, we will try this, and we will have a deadline until the end of the decade. Not the, the simple deadlines that our politicians have, which is the next election, yeah? but the long term. 10 years, okay, the long-term thing. And this is what he said, we choose to go to the moon, is the name of uh, the speech, and he, um, he dedicated the whole country's efforts, or one of the biggest efforts of the country, to bring a man to the moon and safely bring him back to Earth again. And um, as you see, there's lots of links and URLs in my speech that, that give you background information. And I think we need this concept, this a concept, a speech, an idea like that again in Europe, so that we can also start to catch up, overtake, or uh, in any way implement solutions that, that follow our ideals, our ideals of living, our civil rights ideas, our concepts, our European values, yeah? which are, in my opinion, differ, differ a little bit from the US uh, values. And, um, to understand the whole thing, why did it work then, you have to also look a bit, little bit about the background. In uh, th those boomer times in the 60s, well, if you listen to music, you'll find nice background, that, like the, the, the old song that we didn't start, The Fire, he's got lots of uh, buzzwords of that time, In Moonshot is also in there and, and stuff. And other songs you may know, it's going to be a long, long time. We're talking about the long run. That was Elton John, I think, or David Bowie with his Space Oddity songs. Can you hear me, Major Tom? All of that was sort of like the zeitgeist of that era. And what is our zeitgeist today? I've, Dave Matthews Band is very famous in the US. They are really big shots there. They made a song that's called Gaucho, and the whole song has a lot of <laughs> subtext between the lines that is really, really hard. And you can see that they also have a, they, they, there is a, it's hard to believe that they could do that. That's, that's basically the meaning of the song Gaucho from Dave Matthews Band. So the, the 60s were like, the, we can do anything, yeah? And we, today, we are kind of stuck in the believing that we cannot do the long-term things because politicians only think in four years and, and, and. So we, they, the times in the 60s, people seemed to be more open to visions, even though they had Cold War and stuff. But um, that is something I'm thinking about. How can we in, incite people to do these long-term things again? And uh, another two pictures from that time is to get into the, the IT world of the time and to, 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 to make the bridge towards IT. Um, anybody knows Margaret Hamilton on the right? Some of you know. Oh, do you know what this, this pile of paper is? That is the complete software printed out that, that ran the Apollo program, that ran the, ran the moonshot. And it was, and I love to say that it was, she was the team lead of the Apollo IT program. Yeah? And we always tend to think uh, that, that um, women in IT are something um, rare, or today they are something rare, but it hasn't been like that forever. Like the term computers actually referred to women. The computers were the women in the 40s and 50s who would type in data or work with those calculation engines, machines, like here we have a picture from the 40s, that's ENIAC, that's a British system if I remember right, and they did the calculations for ballistic um, curves. And one quote of the ladies that ran ENIAC was, finally we've got a machine that can calculate the, the ballistic curve faster than the projectile flies. <laughs> so, and uh, it was not only min-driven, that's just a side note from me. Um, what also happened in the 60s was, they, in the 60s, a project that was just in the news today again, was started, and that is also, for me, it's, it's, it shows the long-term projects are possible. The Voyager project, it was actually started in the 60s, launched in the 70s, and uh, in 2025, it will, the last of its um, sensors will stop uh, transferring data. 
because it's probably running out of power. And uh, what they already have, they have this record on it. You may remember with Sounds of Earth for the aliens to listen to. And uh, yeah, this is, the, the, this is the, the path of Voyager and seen sort of like from Earth on the Earth sky. And can you see the, the little swings here? Do you know why there are swings? These are the, the years, yeah? So these swings actually represent the Earth movement around the sun. So Voyager is moving like this, but the Earth is moving like this. And in the, in the flight path, you have these swings in there. But wh what I'm saying is that is a project that has been running for 60, 60 years then. And we still have the possibility, the option to communicate with this satellite, with his IT and all of that stuff. Yeah? And that is what a small city in Bavaria, for example, is also trying to achieve. This is from a presentation of the city of Treustlingen. Disclaimer, I'm helping them with digitalization. And um, they found that the core thing in public administration today is rocket science. They have to, to make sure that the data they have is accessible, readable, whatever, 30 years in the past and 30 years into the future. Because your parents' um, birth certificate, for example, has to be readable for your, grand, for your grandchildren, for example, and something like that. So they have to be, they have, and that is from their presentation, they think, or they say that they have the same implications. This is something that spans generations. Yeah? And this is something that I don't really see much in IT, apart from expert systems, which I will come to pretty soon. Do you know the, stone, the Rosetta Stone? I guess some of you will know it. I'm not talking about the space probe Rosetta, which was the first one that landed on a comet. But it's, the Rosetta Stone is an anti an stone from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And um, it had an uh, inscription on it in three languages. I think it was Greek, uh, Egyptian, and another language of the time. And it was just some political... Uh, some, some, some uh, uh, announcement about the kings of Egypt and how to deal with the priests, and uh, we don't understand that any much anymore, but the thing is, they could use it for learning how to understand Egyptian hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs? How do you say in English? Hieroglyphs, yeah? So, and this thing is very successful data, a very successful data storage. I heard a talk about it from an archiving expert from, from Basel University, and he said, this only works because the, you, have it, you have sort of like open standards. Everybody can read it. You don't need anything yeah, to read it. Yeah? It's accessible, kind of. It is a medium that prevailed over the long, in the long run, yeah, long time. And they said, accessible, you, you can, everybody can go there. It was put up in public places. Yeah? And when it was found again by the Nap my Napoleon soldiers, they could immediately start reading it. Yeah? And uh, they found several ones of it, and it was in three languages. That was the redundancy. So, in this Rosetta Stone, you have some qualities that you want for long-term stuff. Long-term stuff that uh, I was—I took this from a conversation that we had just yesterday. I have, a, if you want a work assignment, think of a something like a Rosetta Stone for the Neanderthals of the future. We will live like in 50,000 years or 100,000 years or whatever and try to explain to them if they don't have any knowledge of science what a nuclear waste uh, final um, de depot is and why it's dangerous to go there. If you have a look at these pictograms and these symbols, you already see that it's uh, without the language, it's not really easy to understand. I mean, what does EX mean if you don't look there and see explosive atmosphere? Ah, but it is very, very difficult to think in these long terms. And, but when we look at the technology and about, and uh, when we have to go back to the current state and we have a look, Europe is lagging behind, I said, but that wasn't always like that. So question, who invented the first space capable rocket? and cruise missile. Sorry, I'm from Germany. It was the Germans, of course. Yeah? It's, and you can, it's the, the, the V1 or the flying bomb. Yeah? Who invented the first computer? The first um, 
programmable Turing complete computer? Huh? No, Babbage was mechanical. It was not. I don't think it was computer uh, programmable or Turing complete. It was Suze, the name giver of Suze. Yeah, and. Uh, I have another one. <laughs> what do you think? Why do I mention the Yaruga hydroelectric power plant? It's in Croatia, of course. I mentioned it because it's in Croatia, but it was also a European who, who invented the hydroelectric power plant. And his name and his statue is right 20 meters over there in the university. It's Tesla. So um, it, there is a lot of technology where we Europeans actually were the first. Yeah? But we are not really, uh, say, dominating or not really uh, strong in the market anymore, where we can do better. Yeah. By the, yeah, by the way, the Tesla was Croatian. He went to the U.S., worked with Edison, I think, at first, and uh, then they, they got the fight between uh, alternating current and uh, direct current, and he did the first hydroelectric power plant in Niagara, and the second one in his close to his hometown. So. Um, I said, in IT, US IT technology has always, almost always been ahead, mainly because it was financed by the military. We have the DARPA, who, who built up the internet, and they also had, um, and also the NASA, yeah, and it, with satellites and, and reconnaissance and stuff, and it was financed by military, it was not driven by companies, yeah, the idea, the innovation, the, the whole thing, and uh, that is, according to politicians that I talked to, the main reason why we have um, the topic of digital sovereignty in Europe now, because like in military, we, in Europe we relied, in Western Europe we relied on the, the Americans to, to help us, to guard us, to provide services for us. And that was why we never had to develop similar systems and build up such systems. That's what I hear from politicians, and I find that very credible. So now in Germany we also have the discussion, well, <laughs> Trump came in, Putin came in, and now Europe, in Europe, many people are standing here like, hmm, who can we trust? What should we do? And then Germany is like, okay, we'll invest 100 billion euro in our military, and they obviously don't really know how to invest it, and we don't really know where it's going, but, but I think that might also be an option of actually what, it's, what is there is that we need uh, a, regulation, a regulatory state-driven, European Union-driven approach, starting point into our IT sovereignty and more. Yeah? This is uh, from a German newspaper and it's of course uh, satirical. Um, this is a Green Party politician from Germany and he is uh, in charge of economics and he had to make deals with the sheikhs of Saudi Arabia, Qatar and whatsoever about gas to replace Putin's gas. So they, they made a lot of jokes about him, for example, in this case, that he had to make the deal for the next European uh, championship, and it will be in Qatar. <laughs> and, uh, so, but this shows we had the dependency on Russians ga Russia gas, and that is just one of many... Here we are. Yeah, one of many dependencies we have. Putin's gas is just what brought it to everybody's mind right now, that we are not... Uh, autark, that we are, have dependencies, yes. We are also depending on Chinese hardware, yeah? but okay, Putin is also, they found washing machine chips in the tanks to repair them and stuff like that because China can't deliver because of Corona and it's all, of, it's all a mess, but we are depending on that, we are realizing that. We are depending on US software and so much more. And I do not believe that any invisible hand of the market will fix that. No. There's a lot of people that earn a lot of money with that, but there is examples where Europe caught up, even overtook in many things. There's, have a look at Airbus. What's, what's Boeing doing? Airbus really, really got very far. And the EADS is the European Airbus, the Airbus Defense and Space. They, are, they built Ariane, the Ariane rocket, which was, was, was is one of the most reliable rockets in commercial use for sending up satellites. And in general, the European Space Agency. We also have the term sustainability, that in German it comes from, uh, Nachhaltigkeit comes from wood chopping. And uh, I also had a conversation about that uh, here. And wood chopping, it is a generation thing that the 
the grandfather planted a tree that you can harvest today and you have to plant trees that your grandsons can plant. And that is, that is a thought, that is, that is something that the, 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 in, in, in foresting yeah, has a very important impact, but we, we completely don't seem to have that when we do IT and such. So, and that is also a thought that actually space engineers also have to face when they do generation ships. We have to do stuff, stuff that is sustainable, circular, and uh, our planet right now is doing the opposite. But I, okay, I got 10, 15 more slides. Um, that is sustainability. The other thing is sovereignty. Are you able to make such a decision? Yeah? Can you make that decision? Are you able to remove the stuff that you have right now? And are you able to do an exit from the current IT systems that you have? Or are you completely depending on Facebook, Microsoft, whatever? And an ancient conversation from Munich was the mayor of Munich asking, meeting Bill, Mr. Gates. And Gates asked him, why are you doing this, uh, Mr. Ude? Why are, you going, why are you using a Linux desktop? And he said, to be free. Free from what, said Gates. And Ude said, free from you, Mr. Gates. Uh, and I know there's been ups and downs in Munich. But in the end, this is so typical. You have to, these are oligarchs that, you have to, that we are depending on. Choose yours. Yeah? We're depending on Chinese hardware. We're depending on, on this is Peter Thiel, the right wing, alt right, in, uh, yeah, person behind Facebook also and uh, probably companion of uh, Mr. Trump in, one, in the next election. Well, Putin, then we already had Gates, and this is the king of Saudi Arabia. So, as I said, that was why I had the German economy minister, minister in the picture, because he, we're, we're swapping one dependency from Russia to, to Arabia. But mm, in IT, there's, we have the longest term support that we're thinking about is like 13 years. That is what SUSE is offering with its long-term support program. Yeah? But um, that mostly applies only to expert systems like the Voyager, the, whereas the Linux desktop is an end-user system and you have different expectations there. On expert systems, you can teach people how to work it and I guess no end-user could, could, could address, uh, even though the data is there from Voyager, but nobody could use it. Yeah? And, uh, we had, there is, uh, we had the tsunami warning system when I was at SUSE. They need to, the science, they need 10 years to develop the system, the software. So that was, at that time, that was, they started developing it on a less SUSE Linux Enterprise version. And when they were ready to deploy, the, 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 the software, the operating system underneath, was out of service, out of support. <laughs> So we don't have the long-term approach for things like that. We, and that is really sad. We have to do something about that. Um, uh, the same applies if you do uh, machine learning, where uh, computer and cloud things uh, like um, uh, not, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, software changes much faster than you can certificate it. So it's very hard to, set, uh, to use these things in a, certifi a certificated environment where you have to, like military or whatever. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. And um, we have projects in Europe, Gaia-X was mentioned before, um, which is, has very bad karma in the media right now because it's very, very corporate driven and it's a good approach, but it's, it is, um, well, I, many people see, including me, see it very critical. Project Phoenix in northern Germany is making a Linux desktop for public administration and a web desktop also for that. Um, there's a company behind it and they, they want to be in charge of all of it, so they actually they're producing SaaS and they say you cannot install it in your data center. And I'm like, if it's open source, I should be able to. And they say, ah, no, that doesn't work, whatever. Last thing I'm saying is um, uh, learnings from Estonia. You may have heard of Estonia being the digital, digitalization uh, um, expert in Europe. They call it e-Estonia, one of the most, one of the best developed um, uh, digitalization uh, projects. They, they call it X-Road. I'm jumping over Munich. And the core learnings from Estonia are they were successful because they had somebody, they had the political will, the political leadership, and the cultural readiness in the society, and open standards. So they had someone who said, we will do this, political will. They had someone who said, okay, to achieve this, I will take these measures and we will, we will keep, we will get people together and whatever, so, sort of like the process. First was the decision, then the process, 
And the cultural readiness in the society was also very important. The people there were ready to do something different, didn't want to be dependent on like external software, and it was just a, a, a social state was there in their heads. And the only technical reason for their success is they introduced open standards. Top down. They didn't tell anybody what software to use, and they didn't tell anybody to use open source. They introduced open standards and a reference implementation. This reference implementation is open source. So everybody has a solution, it's open source, everybody can alter it, everybody can use it and change it any way they want. And they can, but they can also, if they're not happy with it, code their own shit, even publish it not under an open source license whatsoever, it doesn't matter because there's always an open source thing there. And that is why they were successful. So that is what I think is very important for that, if in the long run you have to define open standards and let the people use their stuff what they want. On the meta layer, cities like Treuchtlingen, who also want to go in the long run, they, they um, find that uh, when it comes to files, data, content, um, and applications, they, they want to separate the information on the meta layer. Yeah? And they, that is how you can create sustainability for the long run. You reduce the complexity. Because if you have all in one blob, in one solution, it will be hard to maintain. And they have amazing stuff. They have a Linux desktop since 20 years. And they, they have 15,000 inhabitants. And that is also one very important thing. Estonia and or Treuchtlingen, they are not successful because they are small. They are successful despite the fact that they are small because it's much more, important, much more difficult for them to get uh, professional support because they, they don't have the money to pay what like a, a whole country like Germany or, or something can pay. Okay, I said that it's not about tech, it's about political will, leadership, organization and culture. And that's why I think Europe needs a JFK style commitment for true open standards, true open source to achieve its own sovereign and sustainable IT. You need the right stuff for that and I think also, I'm coming back to, to astronauts and stuff. Um, we, in the open source world, and this is something, a field that I'm really interested in, is implications of how we work together in the open source world on our social and society systems. Because I think in these times, with all these catastrophes around, we realize that the way we've been working with corporate financial markets, whatever, hasn't turned out that, bad, that good. At least we are killing the planet with it. And I think that the open source communities have a lot of um, learnings and concepts to offer that we could do better. And uh, some things interesting, they match with astronauts training. I, Laura Winterling, I met her, she's a trainer for astronauts and she did a keynote at a university close to where I come from in Bavaria. And she said, um, she said the, 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 the characteristics on the left is what you want in astronauts. If somebody has that, he might be a good astronaut. If you take and the ones on the left, if you find them, don't put them in a, in a spaceship with other people. <laughs> yeah? Be and that is really interesting because when you go to, to Harvard Business School or whatever, and when you talk to people who come from Harvard Business School, I once had a management training from one of these guys, they will, they will just teach you many of the items on the right side because you have to, be, uh, you have to, to keep your authority. Yeah? Don't admit mistakes and stuff like that. And uh, so, and I think that if you, I mean, Douglas, you're from community management, others are community management. And if I, if I see that, that excellence, that is exactly what I would um, cherish and, and further in people and, and uh, drive it more. And I think that's, here we are with open source and options that we have, and it's the same in, in space education. Education is, this, is the word, the key word for that. So this is what we need. We need education in these terms. We need a philosophy, a vision. I know uh, the term vision isn't very well, uh, well accepted today anymore, but I think we need that. We need a goal, an ethics and a society state model that is generation proof. That, that means it will survive also generations of people. And when we talk about AI, KI, then generations happen in few milliseconds, microseconds. Yeah? And so, think of, think of wood chopping again. So my call to action, and I got only less than a minute left if I see right, my call to action is get engaged, talk to your politicians, 
or the local representatives of your oligarchs. We need Germany invests 100 billion in military, and today they announced they invest 50 million in open source, which is a commitment. Yes, but you see, there's just three digits missing on the on the end to the right here, yeah? and so for that we uh, really need engagement and we need understanding. It's the times are changing; people are understanding it, but it's we are at the beginning and there's small steps, and we need a bigger commitment that is bigger than than uh, election cycles and stuff like that. And something like that, I just scribbled that there, but something like that we need. We, we needed, JFK said we, we chose to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it is hard. That was a large part of his commitment. He said, we do this because we have to achieve that. And that was his, the motivational part of his speech. Yeah? And I would wish for something like this in terms of IT. There's similar things that need to happen in terms of climate change and all the other catastrophes that we have. But this is the core in my opinion. Yeah, your children will thank you. Two minutes late, too late, sorry. <laughs> Come and discuss, probably not here because the next speech is waiting. You know, I'm, I, I, have, I, have, I always have strong opinions, but I'm always ready for discussions and compromise, and nothing is written in stone. Thank you.